Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Norris. We're going to grow your leadership through neuroscience, psychology, and theology. Well, welcome everybody to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. I am especially excited today to have Dr. Terry Wardle. Terry has served as a church planter, a seminary president, professor, author, and international speaker. He directs the Institute of Formational Counseling, Healing Care Ministries, and Healing Care Ministries International. Uh, During his own season of deep brokenness, Dr. Wardle met Christ as he had never known before. And it was that type of transformation encounter that, uh, that actually opens his desires and passions to see other people experience the same kind of thing. And so I just want to say a big welcome to you, Terry. So grateful to have you on the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. Patrick, this is a joy. I've been looking forward to this. We've uh, been uh, working at connecting uh, for a few weeks, and I told my wife I love to get together with someone that wants to talk about Jesus. Oh, come on, man. I love it. Well, I first heard about you and your story on the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast, Mm -hmm. and I personally was moved. I I was inspired. I was very interested in what you said, how you said it, and really the difference your story has made in so many different leaders. In fact, you had a meteoric rise in ministry, quote unquote, successes early on in your ministry as a church planter. Your church grew, it multiplied. At 34, I believe is the age, you became the president of a seminary and uh, you just had a dream leadership resume. But underneath it all, your backstory reached forward, caught up with you, and you found yourself in a psychiatric institution really having to deal with things. Tell us about your, your story, your faith story, and then how that overlaps with what you're doing today. Thank you, Patrick. And you rehearsed some of the details quite accurately. Uh, I, I'll, I'll begin my faith story very young in that I grew up in a home where initially there was no interest whatsoever in religion. Uh, The men in my family believed that religion were for weaklings. And uh, they thought men had a gun in one hand and a beer in the other. And so I grew up in that kind of an atmosphere. And it wasn't until my mother went to a revival when I was a teenager, a very strange revival, by the way, that uh, she began to show interest in faith. So it, it planted a seed in me Uh, And I even had some folks in our little town kind of take an interest in me in terms of the issues of faith. And uh, when I was a teenager, I had an encounter with the Lord, believe it or not, at a Dave Wilkerson, Catherine Kuhlman event uh, that was being (laughs) held in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, The local people had picked up a bunch of teenagers and took us into Pittsburgh on a bus. And uh, he had Nikki Cruz there and some of those other young men. And he talked about the sword of the Lord is coming through the land. And at the end, he basically said, if you don't want to go to hell, come forward. I didn't want to go to hell. So I went forward and I actually had a touch from the Lord. And I think the Lord put a homing device inside of me. But uh, after that initial profound experience of God's love, there was not a nurturing that took place in terms of my Christian life. And so I went on for probably another seven or eight years and got involved in a lot of things I shouldn't have got involved with, which we could talk about if you're interested. And I went off to college and after uh, really just feeling the emptiness of what I was involved with in my senior year, last semester, last days of college, I got desperate and uh, I found some Christian gentlemen, young guys, And I went and gave my life to Christ. And that became a dramatic turning point for me. Uh, Dramatic turning point. And that's where I felt the call to ministry. But Patrick, here's the issue that I want to share with people. God had endowed me with gifting, but I was still carrying along with me the unresolved emotional baggage of a very tough past. Mm. And I just pushed that all away. And God blessed my giftings. And all of a sudden, off it goes, and I become successful as a pastor and then as a speaker. I'm invited to do some writing. I become the head of a seminary. I start a church. It grows and grows and grows. Uh, Really, I think like a thousand people would have counted that as their church 18 months after I started it. But 
that whole time I was carrying the baggage of an unprocessed past. And what happened to me is at a time when other people were thinking that my resume was enviable, I had a deep breakdown. As a matter of fact, I was teaching a week-long course at Alliance Theological Seminary in Nyack, New York. And at the end of that class, it's almost as if when I turned off the lights in the classroom, something got turned off in me and I went into a very deep depression and uh, an experience of extreme agoraphobia. And after fighting that somewhat on my own for three months, I ended up having to be hospitalized, which just shocked people <laughs> because yeah, right. they were seeing all this success. And now all of a sudden I'm in a place that most people don't want to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it interesting that we in our culture look at competence and think that's health? Mm -hmm. And yet you can have great competencies, skills developed, and still be dealing with things that you're talking about. So again, you, when you came to Christ in this second wave, uh, it was seven or eight years later, I think is how you said it. How old were you at that point? 22, I believe. So at 22, and mm -hmm. then you began to pursue ministry. That's Probably right. your, your gifts were so uh, beautiful, the glory of God that was coming in your gifts. And you were probably getting, felt like maybe some of the deeper needs were being met as you are, although it didn't really meet it, it just was temporarily making you feel better because you had power or fame or successes. What you were doing seemed to work. Um, you even write about all this in your book called Some Kind of Crazy, and you detail your story. So you're talking about this baggage. I'm sure our listeners are thinking, Terry, what, what's the baggage that you had? I mean, you are an all-star. You're like somebody that every pastor would dream of having those kind of results. And now what, what was behind all of it? So t take us through it. Well, there were several things. Uh, let's begin with the fact, as I mentioned, that I wasn't raised in a spiritually nurturing environment. Uh, it was a very blue collar family. Uh, my grandfather was actually a criminal. My grandmother was actually, when they got together, let's just say a woman of ill repute. Uh, they had to get married and they had my dad, they had my aunt, they gave the kids away to a neighbor, they went off running around. And so all of that, you know, genetic, if you will, epigenetic reality begins to influence as my mother and dad decide to have children. My mom, um, my mom lost her mother at 18 months old and her dad at eight years old and ended up being raised by an aunt that really had difficulties you know, taking on another child among her own children. And my mother never processed her grief. And so in the home in which I was raised, there was this combination of violence and fear. And wow. they came together on a daily basis. Do you know, Patrick, that when I was a young child, my mother would make my sister and I go around to every window and to every door to make sure they were locked and then prop chairs behind the door because she was so sure people were going to come and get us. Oh, which was wow. always interesting because it seemed like all the people that had violence and guns were on my side of the family, but they were very <laughs> concerned about that issue. And then yeah. two events happened that added to this. When I was about five years old, I saw my grandfather die less than three feet away from me. Um, and it was a frightening event. And only a year later, I was sleeping in a bed in the bed next to the bed where my grandmother was and she died. And so I have all of this unprocessed trauma and I'm filled with fear and I'm coming from a family that didn't have a center. Well, that created a lot of dysfunction. So as a small boy, I was quite afraid. And then when I became a young teenager, 12, 13 years old, I found that anger and achievement could still the storm of the fear but it didn't wow. eliminate it. So all I was doing yeah. was anesthetizing deep wounding and deep hurt and deep fear. And I have to tell you that when I came to Jesus, those things didn't go away. Those healed, those wounds weren't healed. Amazing. It was the work Jesus yeah. had to do down the road and I didn't know it. So here I go, I get into ministry and people are affirming me. 
I'm advancing beyond my peers. And it felt like I was finally a somebody. But that whole time, I had this, if you will, grand canyon of unresolved emotional wounding that was deep inside. And even things I haven't mentioned that I do detail in the book. And all of a sudden, I couldn't run from it anymore and I fell right in there. Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. My name is Patrick Norris, and I am a husband, father, pastor of 35 years, and a strategic therapeutic mentor to leaders in all arenas of life. I am an inerrantist, a Calvinist Armenian betweenist, a Holy Spirit continuist, and a finished work of Christ redemptionist. Red Ink Revival was designed to create a revival in the heart, soul, and brains of Christian leaders from all spheres of influence. Our team of pastors, psychologists, and therapists facilitate our life-changing leadership, personal growth, and emotional wholeness experiences. Our goal is to bring a revival, an integrated wholeness to pastors, church staff, the local church, and the universal Big C Church around the world. This includes marketplace leaders, educators, foster adoptive parents, and so much more. If this podcast is providing value to you, would you consider subscribing to it wherever you get your podcast? Also, please like the episodes, comment on them, and share them on your social media feeds. And one more big, big favor. If you like the show, please go review it at Apple. And if it's true of you, give us five stars. Now let's go back to this week's episode. One of the stories that you tell is how your, your grandfather was a womanizer and yeah. he would go find somebody or he had a, an, a, a hookup uh, on his calendar and he would take the five-year-old Terry mm -hmm. and so that grandma wouldn't suspect anything. Can you tell that story? Because to me, I, I heard that, and I, I remember the first time I heard it, I'm working out at a gym, and I just, I'm flooded with emotion of mm -hmm. what it would be like to be a five-year-old boy having to face that. Well, there's, yeah, and I'll give you the story. One small detail that's a shift, but I was in my grandmother and grandfather's clapboard house, staying there, and grandpa came in and his wife beat her shirt and said to my grandmother, I wanna take Terry for a ride. Well, she was a little surprised by that, then she smiled. I looked at her like, should I do this? And off we went. We got in the car, we drove out a road called Mingo Creek Road, then he turned on a, uh, what's called a two track. And he starts going way back into the woods as it's getting darker and darker. And then he tells me to climb on the back seat and get on the floor. Well, I got in the back seat and I saw him pull a revolver out of the glove box, which as a kid looked as big as a cannon. He oh, didn't gosh. give the revolver to me. He then told me, get on the floor, I'll be back. He oh, then gosh. left. Oh, he gotcha. locked the door and he left and it was pitch dark. And can you imagine, I mean, I'm doing everything but maintain sanity. I'm feeling the velour seats. I'm kind of crying, oh God, help me, help me. Well, my grandfather was off having an adulterous relationship with a neighbor who was mm. at work himself in the afternoon shift. And uh, mm. Grandpa finally came back. I heard footsteps. I was breathing heavily. He got in the car. We started driving home. And all he said to me is, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody about this. I mean, to tell you, it's just frightening. And eventually, I did tell my parents and they played it off. They knew what was going on because wow. later when I was an older man, my dad told me, oh, he was over at so-and-so's house and he would sneak in there. And my grandfather would use me as that kind of a ruse. And I mean to tell you, it had a devastating impact in terms of fear to be yeah. in a darkened car, in the woods, seeing a gun, laying on the floor, trying to maintain a sense of sanity and then not being allowed to tell. Amazing. And then in your career, or, and even in your spiritual formation years, as the ministry is having this rise in fruitfulness, success, you talk about how you employed some spiritual Christian solutions, but they didn't meet you at your deepest need. What were some of those solutions that you endeavored to answer the deeper need, but it wasn't actually fixing it? Okay, uh, a good run up to that would be to say this. Uh, 
neurobiologically, when we're wounded, we're wounded episodically. We're wounded because we've had an experience, and that experience has sights and sounds and behaviors and meaning and feelings, sensations. That's how we're wounded. But when I became a Christian, most of what I was taught was how to grow through the left brain. So read more books, uh, memorize more scripture. (laughs) And it isn't that scripture isn't powerful, but when scripture is simply another piece of information you're putting into the left brain, it doesn't touch where your wounding is. And that was something that was true. And there was a bit of frustration. So I would work hard. I was achieving for the Lord. I was using my giftedness. I was even reading scripture, but it wasn't touching it at all. Because, and this is something that neurobiology will tell you, um, concepts will not rewire the brain. When the brain's been wired episodically, it must be healed episodically. And that's where change and transition began to occur with me. Um, And I'd be willing to talk about that because you go to a psychiatric hospital and I spent almost a month there and they helped me understand what was wrong. But very little was changing because I was understanding it, left brain. But there was nothing episodically happening to me that was rewiring the brain. So really, I was using spiritual painkillers instead of non-spiritual painkillers. And something had to happen. Yeah, I I think about how we're wounded in experiences. We're not Mm -hmm. wounded in concepts. We're Mm -hmm. wounded in experiences. And yet we try to heal through concepts. And Mm -hmm. now it's doctrine and, you know, theology and, you know, sitting around and, you know, Christian philosophizing, if that's a word, uh, around it. I love what you're saying. So even today, Terry, I talk to a lot of people who have found themselves in the throes of addiction. They go into a 30-day inpatient program, uh, and some inpatient programs still do not address the trauma profile, the family of origin, attachment injury. And I'm shocked by it with so much available to us around that. So I'm a little bit surprised. I'm I'm actually more than a little bit surprised that you went to a psychiatric inpatient program. And when you got there, they actually were talking to you about your story. And so Mm -hmm. tell us what you learned, even though it was conceptual yet not experiential. What did you learn there? Well, I learned the relationship between unresolved emotional wounding and dysfunctional behavior. Yeah. that we often see a dysfunctional behavior and we just say to somebody, stop it. Or we tell them it's wrong and it's sinful and we're not aware that a dysfunctional behavior is often a symptom of something deeper inside that is broken. And I learned that and I learned also that we can live our lives around false beliefs like I don't measure up, I have to please other people to have my core longings met. If someone really knew me, they'd dislike me. And I learned these very important principles But I want to make this differentiation. Yeah. In our lives, there's what is true and what is real. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. And what is true is often conceptual. What is real is episodic. Am I clear so far? Yeah. Now, let's push it a little further. When you've been abandoned as a child, that's real. It's real. It affected your emotions it affected your sensations and you begin to believe things out of that because it's real all of a sudden somebody tells you the scripture um, god will never leave or forsake you it may be true but it doesn't feel real yeah do you see because the real was shaped by an episode and so what we need is ways to position people to experience what is true as also real and that's why we need spiritual community Um, experiences where people come together and they don't just learn about Christ, they meet Christ. They're just not told that they're loved by Christ, but the body of Christ loves them. The experiential component becomes extremely important. Hey, have you ever wanted to explore how your backstory is influencing your present story? Have you ever wondered why you were driven 
the way you are driven or why you want the things you so deeply want or why you might be triggered the way you're triggered. Maybe there's something in your life that keeps derailing you or exposing the fractures in your heart and soul. At Red Ink Revival, I facilitate groups of six to 10 men or six to 10 ladies in an exploration process that includes worksheets, tools for discovery, and insights into personal motivations, torments, and reactions. And it's all done online through Zoom in a short six-week experience. Now don't worry, you won't be required to share anything you don't want to. Your story is yours to share when and where you're ready. But first, you owe it to yourself to know what that story actually is. Our alumni report having life-changing experiences and integrations in all spheres of life. They report it actually felt like they entered into a revival. They even say they now lead others like never before as they instinctively map their teammates' own story considerations. We're developing groups specific for individual classifications like senior pastors or spouses, church staff, educators, foster adoption parents, marketplace leaders, and churches at large. Go to redinkrevival.com and find the events tab to learn more. One of the things we do at Red Ink Revival is I help pastors, church staff, others go through their story work. I help them mm -hmm. identify where the intense moments of their life happened and why their brain kept hold of it and the memory is so available to them. Mm -hmm. And as we do, we call it, of course, story work. Mm -hmm. You have actually said, and this is a, a quote from you, God wants to meet us in our story and he wants to access all parts of our story. God doesn't just want to access to the good parts of our story. God doesn't just want us to become better at sin management. He wants to heal our hearts at the root of things. And so, mm -hmm. mic drop on that one. Tell us what you mean. Well, I think there are many of us, I know I was, that would be true of me, that I was not only experiencing pain of what had happened to me in the past, but I was encased in the shame of what had happened in the past. Ooh, yeah. So yeah. what I tried to do was keep it in the past. I was embarrassed by it. I believe that Jesus wanted me to meet him on the high mountain of ethical and moral achievement. <laughs> and yeah. I was basically taught from the very first time I became a Christian that now you've got to learn what Jesus wants you to do, what Jesus wants you to be. So it was all about being a better me. Yeah. Well, there was still a broken me that I'm ashamed of back in my past. And what yeah. I learned is that Jesus wants to take us on a journey of reclamation. He loves those parts of us that we're trying to hide, and he wants to redeem that story that we seem to want to hide. And there's nothing that brings God more glory than mm. a dark story being brought into the light and Jesus transforming it into something of light. And yeah. I am convinced that even among the body of Christ, and especially with pastors, there are stories that have not been told. Yeah. And they're trying to behave above their own story. Yeah. And what they need to Absolutely. learn is that Jesus is right there beside them in the ditch. As a matter of fact, Patrick, I once threatened to develop something called ditch theology. That <laughs> Jesus meets us more in the ditch than he ever does on the high mountain. And that. we've got to admit that some parts of us are in that ditch a little boy yeah. that's watching his grandfather die, a boy laying on a cold floor in a bathroom receiving multiple enemas, one right after the other over a series of period of time. I just want to shove yeah. that all away. Jesus yeah. wants to go back and redeem that because we orphan pieces of ourselves hmm. by the parts of our story we don't want to address. Yeah. And Jesus wants to bring all the orphans home. Wow, wow, wow. And I think about how we're, we're only as sick as our secrets. Mm -hmm. The secrets give power to things in our lives. And so shame 
compels us to those secret parts of ourselves. We don't want to face them. We don't want other people to hear them or know them. And yet the very secret itself is the voice of shame. It's actually a metric to know that shame has roots and has a, has a hook in us because we don't want anybody to know. Now, I'm not saying this is something you tell everybody who, you know, is publishing journalistic, you know, newspaper articles and except it's not for the world, but you have to have a group of people that you are safe with, that you're going to share life in. Because if you don't, whatever that secret is, is going to continue to have momentum and then ultimately create a consequence in your life that is not what you ultimately want. Would you agree with all of that? And how would you take that and run with it? Well, I, I absolutely agree with that. And shame is this basic sense that I don't measure up. And the enemy points to something in our life that in some way identifies that for us. Because this happened to you, or because you did this, or because this didn't happen to you, therefore you're less than. If people really knew, they would reject you. And so shame locks us down. And here's, yeah. here's something that yeah. just is amazing to me. There are multiple scriptures in the Old Testament. Isaiah 61 is one, Zephaniah 3, that says this. Both say the same thing that God wants to give us an inheritance in the place where shame once reigned, that the place of shame can become a place of inheritance. And for how many people wow. do we learn that the part of our story we don't want to tell becomes the part of our story that God uses to advance the kingdom of God? Look at mm. Charles Colson or Henry Nouwen. You know, I can go on to many other names of people who could have hidden that story, but God met them in that story. He is such a compassionate God. He moves to the broken places, not, you know, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not put out. And yet when we're raised in a Christianity that's calling us to measure up, we're afraid that we're gonna be judged for this brokenness when in fact God is longing to meet us in that brokenness. Yeah, yeah. That is so beautiful. And I, I look at scripture and I think about even Romans 12, when he talks about being transformed by the renewing of your mind, if we could just look at the word transformed, the assumption is, is that we're not. Mm -hmm. And we never get to graduate to, oh, I am fully transformed. As humans, we are in a process of sanctification from the time we're born to the time we go home to be with the Lord. And what that says to me is that there are things that are still being resolved and worked out, healing happening in us. So the normative is, is that I have been brokenhearted. I have storylines that have fractured me and fragmented me. And now I have to address that for the rest of my life and go from faith to faith and glory to glory. I am letting the power of God bring healing. Somewhere in Christianity, we got to this place of a standard of flawlessness and perfection and we are judgmental and harsh to ourselves if we're not living in that perfect standard. You have created, uh, and I don't know that you still do it, but you had what was called Pastors of Excellence. I think okay. you did it through a seminary, mm -hmm. um, and it's where Carrie went. In fact, Carrie Newhoff talks about that that one event with the follow-up experiences saved both his ministry and probably his marriage. Yeah. So. As we dig into the normal part of the human experience, rather than acting like that somebody who's fragmented, fractured, brokenhearted, that they are the exception, we look at it as though, no, that's normal. And if you haven't dealt with your stuff, you're going to have to face it at some point. Talk mm -hmm. about Pastors of Excellence. What did you do there? What was the event like? And what did you work on with your attendees? Yes, this happens a number of years ago. The Lilly Foundation was offering grants for seminaries and other institutions to help pastors. Okay, that's why the, they, they were uh, providing these funds. So uh, several of us at the seminary gave them a proposal and they gave us a, a large grant. And out of that grant, we began to move forward to help people in ministry. Now, here's where and I remember Carrie was one that was really thrown by this, 
they read Pastors of Excellence and they think they're going to come. And for the next year, it's a year long program in which they would come, I think, five times over the year for three or four days, all paid for. He's figuring he's going to learn better ways of evangelism, better ways of preaching. Not at all. What we put together was a program that said effective ministry is based on an authentic life. And an authentic life means you have to deal with three things. What is the nature of real relationship with God? What's the unresolved, you know, wounding internally? And how do you really connect with people in vulnerability? And so that's what we would lecture about. And then they'd get in groups and they would experience it and there'd be tears and there'd be anger. And I remember after the first day, Carrie was uh, thinking seriously about leaving, saying, what did you get me into? (laughs) But after that, God really grabbed hold of him and many others. We ended up having hundreds of pastors from many denominations and genders go through this. And it was a, a profound experience so that so that leaders could recognize that they don't want to have happen to them what happened to me, where yeah. all of a sudden you're building your ministry, but underneath it is this unresolved emotional wounding of the past. And part of that has to do with identity formation. And part of it has to do with a very unhealthy view of what Christianity is all about. You know, Patrick, um, probably six times now, when my wife and I maybe have been traveling somewhere close for me to speak, I've seen the same billboard. And this is what the billboard says. Real Christians obey the teachings of Christ. Oh, right, right. And I have a serious problem with that. Because there we have it, right there, that's it. Only the obedient, only the whole, only those that haven't sinned, only those that that aren't broken are real. That is not Christianity. If they just said, real Christians should obey the teachings of Christ, fine. But as soon as you put real with obedience, you're putting real with unbroken. And then people are going to hide because who wants to be rejected? Yeah. Jesus yeah. was yeah. a wounded healer. He wants us to be wounded healers. He wants his power to flow through our wounds to bring a healing presence to other people. How would you like to reboot your personal finances this year? How would you like to take control of your money, turning small wins into big results? I want to encourage you to check out my wife, Tina's financial coaching business at tinanorris.org. You might be wondering, what is a financial coach? A coach is someone who will personally team up with you to outline financial goals, inspire you with energy, help you stay focused on your goals, and so much more. You can do it all through Zoom, and she provides a free initial consultation, so there's no pain or cost to you for your first steps. Maybe you've been to several Financial Peace University cycles, left with great intentions, but struggled to execute. You need a trainer, a coach, another human that won't shame or judge you to help you stay on track. She works with clients that are single parents, everyday people, pastors and church staff, as well as high income professionals. If you have friends, church members, clients, or even young marrieds that are launching their financial lives, you will do them all a favor to have them check out this amazing option. If professional athletes need a coach to win the day to fulfill their dreams, then you and I do too. And you won't find anybody better to help you get there than Tina Norris. Set up your free consultation from anywhere in the world today. Go to tinanorris.org to find out all the details. What would you say to somebody who says, well, in 1 John it says, uh, you know, if you love God, you'll keep his commandments. Well, actually, it it even pushes a little further on that. It says, uh, if you remember, um, those who love God will not continue in sin. You remember that? Yeah. Okay. Now, here's the question. Is that an expectation or a promise? I see it as a promise. Mm. Beautiful. See, I think this is the promise. God says this. Yeah, we're going to skin our knees. We're going to wander. We're going to go off into our own pig style and eat pig pods. But those who are born in God will not continue to sin. Why? Because God woos them home. 
Yeah. Have, have you ever thought, Patrick, I'm sure you have, of how many scriptures in the New Testament say God's the one doing the work in you? I mean, I could yeah. list 15 right now. We, you know, the yeah. famous yeah. one, he who began a good work. We know that one. But yep. 1 Thessalonians 5 says it, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I mean, here's Paul in 1 Corinthians about to tell people they're doing some bad behavior, and he starts by saying things with, you're chosen by God. You will be kept faithful to the end. My point being, God's at work. So how do I read that first John passage in four? It's a promise. And when you make it an expectation, you lose its power. That's beautiful. I, I, again, I just love the way that you frame stuff and articulate it. A minute ago, you mentioned that you worked in these pastors of excellence environments with people's their identity the mm -hmm. identity in uh, one of your interviews you talked about uh, edwin friedman's book failure of nerve and, and here's a quote the problem in leadership is not failure of competency but a failure of identity and then mm -hmm. you went on as a result leaders use performance and achievement as a way of advancing themselves and friedman would say no matter how much you move leaders towards competency if they don't know who they are and if they're not di a differentiated leader it's going to lead to serious problems mm -hmm. so what is an identity? What is it? And unpack the whole idea for us. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I'll come at it from a couple different angles. I love what Freeman does in that book, Failure of Nerve, on this title, this topic, because he basically says this, effectiveness in leadership is about self-definition. And that's just his word from, for identity. You've got to know who you are. It's not about competency. You've got to know who you are. And... And um, for me, identity, and I wrote this in a book called Identity Matters, identity is not what makes you unique. Identity is the foundation upon which your uniqueness rests. Now, let me say that again. Identity is not what makes you unique. It's the foundation upon which your identity rests. So many of us have been learned that our uniqueness rests on our performance. You see that? Mm, yeah. Our uniqueness rests on our performance. So... We've got to do better, earn more, achieve more, accumulate more in order to prove we've performed. Wow. Um, but the problem with that is you're placing your identity in things you can lose. You can lose your competency. You can lose your, you know, if you put your uh, identity in your appearance, you know what it's like. We get older, and you don't look the same. Um, you can lose your athletic ability, and all of a sudden there's a despairing, well, then who am I? Yeah, However, right. it says in uh, Galatians chapter 4 that Jesus, born of a woman, came in order that we could be children of God. Okay? And then he says, filled with the Spirit, given an inheritance. Our uniqueness rests on the fact that we are children of God. Follow? That's different. Yes. Performance is shifting sand. People-pleasing is shifting sand. Being a child of God is the solid rock. You're yeah. a somebody because you are a child of God and you cannot lose it. Yeah. There was a great African-American statesman, theologian named Howard Thurman. I love to read Howard Thurman. He's been gone for 40 years to be with the Lord. But Howard Thurman wrote a book called Jesus and the Disinherited. And he tells a couple stories that I think would be good for me to rehearse. He grew up in the Jim Crow South. He faced the, the, the oppression uh, of uh, racism. And yet he had this rock solid sense of who he was. And when he was asked about that, he said this, my grandmother was a slave. And he said that the slave owner would bring a slave preacher in and he would preach Paul, be obedient to your master. And they would call us names and they would call us slave and they would say that we're less than human. And then she said, but when that slave preacher, when that preacher left, one of our people began to preach and they always told us we're a child of God. And that became our strength. Well, Howard Thurman went on to say this. My grandmother gave me the stability to stand strong because I knew no matter what anybody else says, my identity is child of God. And then he wrote in the book and said this, 
it's knowing, it, here's an important point, uh, Patrick. He said, awareness of being a child of God is what gives you strength and courage. He didn't say being a child of God gives you strength and courage. He said being aware of wow. being a child of God. There are so many Christians today, and I was one of them, that place their identity in things they could lose. Yeah. You see? Yeah. And I lost. Yeah. I lost them yeah. all. I lost the great church. I lost being the president of a seminary. I lost a reputation because I went where? To a psychiatric hospital. You see, I had built on a false foundation. But once I discovered I'm a child of God, none of those define me. Yeah. And this is what we need. We, we need more Christian leaders that know who they are so that they're not negotiating their leadership skills around proving they're somebody. So good. Do you know, so Patrick, good. I say this to people all the time. Nobody gets to define you but Jesus, not even you. And mm, Jesus I says, you're a child of God. Pastors, did you know that upwards of 70% of the men in your congregation are regularly accessing pornography, stuck in shame, torn in conflict, and therefore immobilized for zealous ministry? That's seven out of 10. The problem is not gonna go away. What are you doing to lead your men into wholeness? Porn and sex addiction is characterized by undesirable compulsive behaviors that feature incongruence with personal values and it interferes with normal living, causing stress on their relationships with God, family, friends, loved ones, and possibly even their own work environment. Well, where do you send men to recover and become both whole and integrated? Red Ink Recovery offers a unique program exclusive to porn and sex related addictions. Our clinical professionals, our psychologists and therapists have created a transformative treatment process that collects the dots, connects the dots, and corrects the dots that have driven the addictions. Our approach heals the heart, restores the soul, and rebuilds the neuroplasticity of the brain. Our clients find their lives have been wildly marked by Christ as they are given a path for trust being rebuilt. And they are resourced for far greater relationships and intimacy than they have ever known before. All of our professional teammates are experts in the field of sexual addiction. They are all trained by Dr. Patrick Carnes and certified by the International Institute of Trauma and Addiction Professionals. Dr. Carnes is known as the father and curator of modern sexual addiction recovery as a movement. Pastors, we encourage you to recommend your men who struggle to come to one of our intensives. If you are a, just a simple man that struggles, maybe you're new to the faith or you don't even know what you believe about Christ, be encouraged to join us. We will honor your journey and give you the tools to live in wholeness. To find out more about our porn and sex addiction intensives and when the next one is, go to redinkrevival.com. You gave this distinction between being a child of God and being aware, mm -hmm. which again moves you from concept to experience, to That's an right. episode moment of mm -hmm. feeling his love and the intimate interaction, the koinonia with him that does change the way the brain functions and then restores you even from wounding. It's interesting because in addiction work, Terry, uh, I'm certified with the International Institute of Trauma and Addiction Professionals, Dr. Patrick Carnes, who is the leading sexual addiction mm -hmm. voice in the world today. And he trained us and I am you know, very humbled that I even got to go through it. But while I'm going through it, a secular organization, I'm learning so much about human behavior. And he talks about how that at the root of all sexual addiction and really every addiction, at the root is what is called an intimacy disorder. It's an anxiety disorder or it's a shame disorder. That all three of those are synonymous, but when he talks about an intimacy disorder, the behavior is chasing what 
is intimacy in a healthy, functional way should be able to provide. But because we don't have that capacity at the moment because of our injuries and attachment, we reach for whatever the addictive behavior is. And so we're not talking about, you know, the management of behavior. We're talking about becoming whole spirit, soul, and body. Um, this, uh, this again moves us from the idea of uh, concept into experience when the Bible says perfect love cast out fear. It's not the concept of perfect love. Right. It is the episode or the experience of that perfect love that actually restores the neural pathways. It actually creates wholeness in the way our brain works. We talk about that, but you know, you even talk about things like workaholism, which is rampant within Christian communities, um, particularly in church leadership, that workaholism in ministry is not really a matter of theology. You say it's a matter of pathology. That's talk right. more about that. T tell us more about what you mean. Well, I think uh, this is an epidemic among Christian leaders. I've been in settings where pastors almost brag about how long it's been since they've had a day off. And they kind yeah. of play, can you top this? And it's yeah. it's not good at all. Uh, Self-care is one of the most important things we can do for advancing the kingdom of God. Yeah. But this, this issue uh, for many individuals is workaholism is really nothing more than another painkiller that we've embraced dysfunctionally to try to still a deep storm inside. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, if you don't mind, let me go a little different direction than Patrick Carnes, yeah. who I yeah. have read. And I'm gonna, use, I'm gonna use six words, but I'm gonna set it up this way. Yeah. I believe God has created us with deep longings. He created those longings. And he yeah. wanted all of those longings to drive us to him. The longing to belong, the longing to be loved, the longing to be secure, the longing for significance and purpose and understanding. All of us have those deep longings. Yes. Apart from God, we begin to look into all kind of other directions to fulfill those longings. Okay. And so we go through people pleasing, we go through performance, but let's take it another level. When those don't satisfy, the pain of unmet longings drives us to dysfunction. And I believe that many people that are in addictive behaviors or if not addictive behavior, process addictions and dependencies, yeah, yeah. that those are ultimately driven by unmet core longings in their lives and they're trying to kill that pain and they're trying to satisfy that need. Yes. And that I, I often say to people this, if you meet somebody that's got an addiction, in your head should be this, I've got good news. Deep beneath your behavior, I know what you really need. Mm -hmm. And I want to position you to meet the one that can fulfill what it is you really need. So behind every man with a sexual addiction is a longing for significance or belonging or love. Yeah. But it got twisted away into something dysfunctional. So and so what we're looking for is how do we begin to let Jesus begin to heal the unmet mm. needs of our lives, those emotional woundings, so we get down to this place where Jesus wants to meet us. Yeah. You know, Patrick, I have a, just happened to have a new book coming out. It should be out in a week or two. And the book is called From Broken to Beloved. And the story of why I wrote it is, it's a sad story that leads to something positive, but... I wrote in the introduction to the book this, that I've learned at my age that it is not achievement that changes a life, it's awakening. It is wow. not achievement that changes a life, it's awakening. Wow. Remember Howard Thurman, awareness of being a child of God is what gives you courage. We need awakenings, not just one, but over our lives, awakening after awakening, where the spirit opens our eyes and our spiritual senses to the flow of the kingdom to the freedom of grace, to the mercy that God wants to give us. Many of us have been raised in a Christianity based on performance and achievement. Yeah. The true change comes from awakening. And now we've mm, got to position so people for awakening. And we yeah. can do it. Wow, what a statement. 
I just I resonate with that and something that I want to chew on for a little bit and get all the nutrients out of that I can. That is a that's that's awesome. I can't wait to get to read your book. Um, and again, it, it goes back to understanding our stories. It goes back to knowing what's happened in us. I, I, I even uh, have read uh, from Dr. Ted Roberts, who wrote things like Pure Desire. And in it, he goes into King David's story. And he shows that when Samuel shows up at Jesse's house, his dad, he goes over all the brothers and then says, do you have anybody else? Mm -hmm. And the Jesse's Jesse says, well, I've got one more uh, out in the field. And the word that's used in the Hebrew for the one that's identified as out in the field is the word Katan. And Dr. Roberts expresses that that is a Hebrew word that means the worthless one. Well, if that is true and you have this massive father wound in him, it explains how he could have a heart after God. And mm -hmm. yet all of this uh, shrapnel and collateral damage happens throughout his life. Um, is, is that some of what you're talking about when you're dealing with the losses that somebody, you even say that if I go into a room of pastors, I can feel the ungrieved losses in the room. That's right. And you say they had hopes, they had dreams, and guess what? Somebody or something hit them right between the chops. Is this the kind of thing you're talking about? Well, it's one of, it's one of the types of things I'm talking about. And yep. I think what yep. happens is that we... We don't know how to process that. You know, let's just, you work with leaders. You know, a lot of leaders, they do not know how to grieve losses. They don't oh even gosh. know that they're allowed to grieve losses. They re-Christianize a story in order to make it, you know, be something that's going to bring God glory. But the bottom line is it's got to start with grief. Yeah. Um, I often read yeah. to people Psalm 109 because it's just this amazing story of uh you know, the, the psalmist is angry and he says, oh, God, you know, let his children become orphans. Take his crops from the field. You can feel this vitriol coming. Do you know, Ans uh, yeah, Anselm Gruen, German writer, he said something that impacted me 15, 20 years ago. Raging before God through a lament at the offense of the other is the only way to get that off of you. You wow. have to rage before. You've got to say it the way it needs to be said. So here's what I've learned about from my life, and here's what I've learned about most Christians. They got wounds inside, yeah. emotional wounds that have happened. Those wounds create a lot of false beliefs. I don't measure up. Nobody loves me. Everybody leaves me. Those false beliefs create a lot of emotional upheaval and pain, and mm -hmm. therefore we start acting out in dysfunctional behavior. And as a pastor, I used to preach to try to get them to stop their dysfunctional behaviors. But I didn't realize back then how much of that was driven by loss, by lies, and by wounds. Yeah. Jesus didn't cross the universe just to provide spiritual whiteout for sin. He crossed the universe to renew us and to take every aspect of our story and renew it to his glory and to his honor. That's awesome, man. Ah, I love it. Go ahead. No, I, I think that's that's something that we want to give to people. And, and that's what I'm spending these last 20 years doing. That, Well, let me say it this way. When I was in the psychiatric hospital on the first night, I had deep depression, severe agoraphobia. Everybody I loved was on the outside. I was in a lockdown unit on the inside. I could hardly think a sane, thane, a, a sane thought. And all of a sudden, a phrase from Corey Ten Boom came back to me, my only sane moment. And I had heard her say this, <clears throat> the object of your greatest pain can become the source of your greatest blessing if you offer it to God. And all wow. I could say then was this, God, I don't even know if you exist anymore, but use this. Now, as I came out of the hospital, there were other colleagues that said, don't ever tell anyone, anyone that that happened. You'll lose your reputation. It'll spoil your ministry. Well, I did tell. And I guess my ministry did get left behind. But for the last 30 years, I've had a ministry that's grown out of that dark period. It's the promise of Isaiah 45, verse 3. I will give you treasures of darkness hidden in secret places. 
Ooh, come and on. I found a treasure in the darkness. And now I've been able to spend the last 30 years writing, forming an organization, sharing with great people like you that God meets us in our darkness. He meets us in the worst part of our story. And he turns that story into something that brings him glory. Just like Genesis 50, verse 20. You meant it for yeah. evil. God will use it for good. Let me break in one more time and tell you about RedInkRevival.com. That is R-E-D-I-N-K Revival.com. I want to encourage you to go there and sign up for our blog e-newsletter. Is every month it will hit your inbox with a blog post and new special events that will ink your soul with revival. When I hear about the griefs, and uh, even when you were on Kerry Newhoff's podcast, the, the original conversation that I heard, uh, you mentioned that people don't know how to process grief. Mm -hmm. And I just was on the edge of my seat. How do you do it? How do you do it? And I'd love to hear you share in your experience how to go through the grief process and how do you know you've gone through it? Okay, well, let's, let's start with this statement. Every loss in life demands an appropriate season of grieving, whether you lost your favorite person or you've lost your favorite pen. Every loss we experience in life demands an appropriate season of grieving. So good. And that's the beginning place of this issue of lament. Now, it would be unhealthy if you grieve more for your favorite pen than you did for your favorite person. That's why we say an appropriate season of grieving, but all grief needs to come up and out. Grief is to be carried up and out to God so that he can hold it for us. And when we don't know how to grieve, we end up holding it within ourselves. You know what happens? We end up getting back aches and diverticulitis and all kinds of other problems because yeah. grief has to go somewhere and it's supposed to go up and out before God. And it has to go up and out with, before God, honestly. Now, this is where I say Christians are dishonest. <laughs> Do you know that we have a language of emotion and we have a language of information? When you're speaking out of your language of emotion, it is uncensored. It comes out the way it's in there. And there are some people that the way it's in there, it's pretty foul and they're pretty angry, and the words wrapped around it are not used in polite company. Yeah, 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 yeah. What Christians often do is, it starts coming up and then we change it. We, we stop <laughs> it, see. we right, rearrange right. the words. Well, all that does is leave it in there. So how do you grieve? You gotta be in a safe place where someone will not judge you for what comes out of your mouth. Yeah. And then it has to come out the way it's in there. Just say yeah. it. If you're angry with God, yeah. spew it out. The psalmist do it. Can you imagine yeah. Oh, a psalm? Yeah, can you imagine a psalmist saying to God, May all his children be orphans. May his wife be a yeah. widow. But it was <laughs> in there. Yeah. And so part of lament is just what I'm saying. Lord, what's the ungrieved loss in my life right now? And let the Lord bring it up. Then begin to, if you will, whether writing it or speaking it. Bring that lament out, but use your feeling language. Say it as it's really in there. Yeah. And if you theologize it, you will not grieve. <laughs> if you think I shouldn't say that in polite company, you will not grieve. Yeah. It's got to yeah. come up and out the way it's inside of you. And when it does, you'll see what happens in you is like the psalmist. You see this psalmist who's just ripping somebody to shreds and then they it's just like they're out of breath and they say, but God, you're good. You do to them as you choose. I'm just glad you love me. They move yeah. to the doxology. So there's the question. How do we know when we've grieved enough? When we move to the doxology. See, when we're able to automatically go, you know what, God, I said what I needed to say. I have yeah. no more to say. And I feel the relief, and now I just want to give you praise and thanks. And that yeah, could take yeah. time. Yeah, that is so beautiful. I look at these psalms 
Uh, there's so many that are the lamenting psalms. There's the imprecatory, but it's the one where God kill my enemies and then you're angry at God. So what I find interesting is that not only is it allowed, but God said, I'm going to put it in the Bible as a part of the inerrant scripture. I want people to read this for generations. And I don't know why it is, but we take so much of those psalms and want to build doctrine out of them. And maybe the primary purpose is to be able to, in fact, I heard a neuroscientist who's a Christian on his podcast. I don't know where he got the information. I need to get a hold of him and ask him. But he said that originally those Psalms are supposed to be read in community of about 10 to 12 people. And you were to identify the emotions as you were reading them to be able to have empathy and feel what grief is like as it's being spoken for the healing medicine that's in that. Um, and yet, like you say, often what we do is we sterilize it. If I know in our process groups, and I have heard you say the same, <laughs> that you know, I didn't grow up in a cussing uh, family. Um, I heard my dad cuss like twice wow. in my whole childhood. And my mom, uh, she, she wasn't a typical cusser. Uh, now, my mom and dad had a lot of their own issues. They ended up getting divorced. My mom probably should have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of issues, but cussing wasn't a part of it. And part of my Christianity was, you know, where that, you know, I, I cleaned that up and that wasn't a part of it. But when I get into process groups and it's therapeutic environments, um, I'm looking for somebody to have a non-judgmental, and they judge themselves, where if something comes out and they give, you know, a, a big cuss word, I love it because for the first time they tapped into what was real for mm -hmm. the first time. And, uh, and yet, you know, when we are done with that, I'm not promoting that everywhere you go, there's some people that are looking for, you know, reason to just cuss and say things that are brash and et cetera. And it's like, well, if that's happening, we probably need to ask what is below the surface of that rather than judge the behavior. Um, but nonetheless, I so resonate with what you're saying that to get into the grief side, we have to really experience what that feeling is. God wanted a whole book with several chapters, several of these Psalms, that's all about how you can, can grieve a thing. Um, now, one thing that I, I find, and I'd love to hear what you have to say about it, it's one thing to grieve it in isolation in the way that you're describing. It seems to be even more powerful if you have a person who has emotional intelligence who won't judge you, but actually will empathize with you without hyper fixing you or doing spiritual bypass where it's, I'm just trying to give you a solution and encourage you, you're going to be okay. But somebody who says, I see you, I hurt with you, I feel with you. And you, it makes sense that you would feel that way. I validate that this was an injury and that you were harmed. When that empathy is there, and again, in the neuroscience, the nucleus or the anterior cingulate gyrus at that moment of empathy releases oxytocin. The two of you together get calmed in your cortisol. Dopamine gets released in the nucleus accumbens. And then you feel happy. You feel alive. But that doesn't happen in a moment. Even those psalms, the early psalm part of the psalm where the anger or the lament is happening, we don't know, did that psalm take like six years? Yes, did it take six months? Uh, and then you read the last verse of a short psalm and you think that they did it in 30 seconds. And it's like, I think the process might've took a little longer than that. Mm -hmm. So how, is there anything that I've just said that kind of sparks within you further, picking it up and running with it? Well, <clears throat> first, I, I think it's so good for you to be emphasizing the place that grief has in scripture itself. Yeah. Actually, it's about a third of the Psalms are imprecatory. So right. you figure 50 out of 150 or somebody pretty upset and hurting and saying it the way it is. And that is there for a purpose. And also what we learn, if we look back into the history of the Israelite, the community would lament with you. They wouldn't watch you cry. They would cry with you. They would lament. They would connect with this empathy. And that, boy, does that hook up with 
the writings of both both uh, Daniel Siegel and my good buddy Kurt uh, Thompson, because both of them are saying the same thing that there's really no such thing as a fully functioning individual human brain. That to be fully functioning, you need to be connected with other brains. Um, I think it's in uh, Siegel's book on the mind that he defines the mind as a embodied and relational processing system. Yeah. So. This is what we see in scripture. We're supposed to be part of a community. That community connects. Through their empathy, we're able to bring more up and out. Through their acceptance, we're accepted. And I think that's something that's greatly needed. Do you know, Eugene Peterson, I think the book was called Answered Prayer, said one of the problems of the church is the problem of a psalmectomy. The problem of a psalmectomy. We've eliminated the imprecatory psalm as part <laughs> of the normal Christian life. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> what a statement. <laughs> um, what you talk about, this has to happen in safe environments. You say if we're not in a safe environment, we're never going to grieve our losses. And mm -hmm. that there are a lot of people who don't feel safe in themselves with God, the church, or even friendships. So what mm -hmm. does a safe environment look like? What does that look like for someone who's struggling to believe it's even possible? Mm -hmm. Well, let me begin with this notion that safety and trust are hand in hand. You, you are never going to feel safe if you don't have a certain degree of trust. And the one thing we have to be able to say to people is don't make trust black and white. Don't make it either or. Don't do, I either trust you or I don't trust you. Let's start with this. I will trust you to the degree that I perceive you as trustworthy, and I'll take a risk with a little bit more. And so in terms of being with a safe people, a safe environment is being connected to some people that we have taken steps to perceive the degree to which they are trustworthy. Are they confidential? Do they exercise grace? Are they unforgiving? Or are they forgiving? Are they a people that do not try to fix you, but accept you as you are? And as I risk parts of my story with them, I begin to learn whether they're safe or not, or the degree to which they are safe. And so I think that's a very, very important piece. The other thing I say um, is that we want to be around people that speak grace fluently, that they don't speak grace with a performance accent, which I think is true in many places <laughs> in the church, yeah. that people are using words of grace, but they bring that performance piece in. So we want to be around people of grace, wow. people that recognize the generosity of God, that he's not there to stamp on us. You want to be around people that to some degree model the prodigal father, mm. looking for, waiting for, running toward, without judgment. Wow. And, and that's going to take time. It's not something that happens in a moment, whether you're signing up to be with a counselor or you're in a small community, let me back up. Healthy trust is perceptive. I trust you to, to the degree that I perceive you as trustworthy and then I'll risk and I see how you, how you handled my risk. And if it was good, I'll risk some more. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's so beautiful. At Red Ink Revival, we have retreats similar to probably what Pastors of Excellence was like. I'd never heard of anybody else doing it like what you are talking about, but I have psychologists, therapists in-house, and we will uh, take time to psychoeducate what's going on in your story, and then we move into process group, and that's where life really begins to take an interesting turn for health and strength and a lot of grieving begins to happen and, and a lot of trust the people like the guys or their wives who are in gender specific groups will leave and they'll talk about how uh they've never had friendships and closeness like they had it was just one week i also do it over a six-week process 
uh, with different demographics, pastors, pastors, wives, right. church staff, their wives. We're just beginning to do it with educators, uh, adoption, foster care parents. Uh, we will also move into first responders and military. Um, and the reason that I bring that up is both from what we just talked about, but now what is it that you're doing? Uh, what, what is your everyday focus in terms of your ministry? Uh, I know I heard you do something with military now, um, but what all are you doing? And are you still doing Pastors of Excellence? Um, and is there anything you know of that's like that? Of course, we at Red Ink do these things, but I just want pastors and church leaders to have help. So talk about what you're doing. Well, uh, 20 some years ago, I formed an organization called Healing Care Ministries. And uh, out of that came Healing Care International, et cetera. And our basic mission statement is positioning people for transformational encounters with Christ. That's the mission. And then we do it through three veins. We have equipping seminars in which we help pastors, chaplains, counselors, psychologists, physicians on how to position people for this episodic encounter with Jesus, how to deal. We, we integrate their three modalities, behavioral science, neuroscience, and spirituality. And so we do a lot of events there. We have an event coming up October 6th to 9th in Columbus, Ohio, four days. Kurt Thompson's going to be there. I'll be there, Anne Halley, others. And we just help equip people. Then we have empowering events where we just get together and talk about Jesus and the filling of the Holy Spirit and how to be more secure in your identity. And then we have what we call encounter events. And that's where we provide uh, counseling. And that comes in three forms. You can get individual counseling, you know, come once a week online or face to face. We do intensives where yeah. people come and spend a week or two with us. And then we have something called a healing, come away with me healing retreats. So we have a staff of about 15 people that work with me, uh, licensed counselors, psychologists, pastors, uh, and we spend our time doing this. And our whole goal is then to position people for these transformation encounter, transformational encounters with Christ. And then, Patrick, of course, my writing and my speaking is primarily focused in these areas. And all that yeah. comes together to lead a fairly full, full, fairly full life and a full schedule. But we get to see God do exciting things. We've got centers in Canada, in Spain. We've got people doing our work in Singapore. You know, people are broken and they want to hear the good news. Wow. Wow. I am so grateful that you have given yourself to it. I'm so grateful that when you got out of the psychiatric institution that you didn't go uh, down under, you didn't hide uh, because your life is enriched mine. And mm -hmm. I'm so, so grateful. Thank you. Uh, do you have any, any final words that you'd like to offer to our listeners? I think the final word that I'd like to leave everyone with is that God's attachment love is incredibly transformational. Hmm. And that I would like every listener to know that from the very first moment they came to Christ, God endowed them with incredible beauty and gifting. And it's nothing that they have to earn or deserve. And that God wants to spend the rest of their lives awakening them to wonder hmm. and bringing them to healing. And yeah, I, I just said it two years ago, which motivated me to write this new book is if I could only do one thing for the rest of my life, it would be to look in people's eyes and let them recognize that they are a wonder and that all creation waits for who they are to truly be revealed. Beautiful, man. I feel that. Well, how do people find you and your books? Well, my books are all on Amazon, so they can go that direction. If they would go to healingcare.org, they will find the Healing Care Ministries website. It'll have on it all the kinds of uh, 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 events that we're doing. You know, I have a bunch of events coming up this fall, how to get there, talk about our resources that we do, small group material. They could also email info at healingcare.org and just say, I want to be on your mailing list. 
And once they're on the mailing list, then they're always going to be getting information about what we're up to and what we're doing. We're very excited about what God's what God's up to this day through you, through others. I mean, God's meeting broken people where they are. Yes. And we, you know what our staff always says, how do we get to do this? How do we get to do this? <laughs> yeah. And that's the glory yeah. of God. That's awesome. Well, Terry, thank you so much for being on the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. You have been a joy in anticipation that I would get to do it. And I am full. My heart is strong just by the experience today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being on with me. Patrick, it's been a joy. I hope we connect in other ways, but I'm very grateful for what you're doing. We need what you do for the life of the church today. So thank you for this opportunity. 